No professional wrestler encompasses as much of the historical WrestleMania landscape as the dead man himself, The Undertaker. His 27 matches across the first 36 events speak to an endurance befitting the infallible spectre that Mark Calloway portrayed for three decades. But more so than simply the sheer quantity of his first WrestleMania resume is what became known quite simply as the streak. In The Undertaker's first 21 WrestleMania matches, he defeated a who's who of wrestling royals, monsters, and oddities without seeding a single loss. The unbeaten run grew to mythic proportions and is perhaps the first line of the epitaph that defines The Undertaker's 30-year WWE run. I'm Jack from Cultaholic and this is the story of The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak. When The Undertaker first arrived in the WWF in 1990, it became apparent that this wasn't going to be any ordinary wrestler. When you can convincingly portray an unflinching zombie mortician and do so with the sort of gusto that gives the youth of the world nightmares, then you've probably got staying power. A wrestler like The Undertaker isn't beaten all that easily and would usually require the employment of either a magnesium stake or the recitation of an ancient spell to adequately slay. As such, it's no surprise that his first WrestleMania foray was little more than textbook enforcement of the overall Undertaker character. Undertaker's WrestleMania debut took place at the event's seventh incarnation on March 24th, 1991 in the city of Los Angeles. As was custom in those days, the WrestleMania undercard featured a great number of matches that didn't really have a feud or storyline purpose. They just existed to get everybody involved. And at this time, Undertaker was simply collecting victims regardless of the occasion. His opponent was aging star Superfly Jimmy Snooker, whom he dispatched in a matter of minutes. The match is mostly unnotable except as retroactive footage. It was the beginning of something that would one day be cherished. But here, it was just ho-hum, Undertaker squashed a guy. Following a face turn in early 92, Undertaker's WrestleMania forays started coming equipped with grudges. At Mania 8, he sent a treacherous Jake the Snake Roberts packing after tombstoning him on the floor. A year later, he withstood the onslaught of bodysuit-wearing mercenary giant Gonzalez before squeaking out a DQ victory. And following a rest and recovery layoff in 1994, Taker returned to WrestleMania for the 11th event in 95, waylaying King Kong Bundy in the midst of his long and winding feud with the Million Dollar Corporation. To this point, the streak had not been formally acknowledged in any form, which is to say that it probably wasn't even realized at the time that Undertaker was 4-0 at WrestleMania, at least by those in charge. And as the new age Andre the Giant in some respects, Undertaker was simply a colorful attraction. A popular means to an end that wasn't there to have all-time classic battles, but rather to vanquish various nuisances on the big stage. Him defeating a parade of heels at WrestleMania was more out of sensibility rather than a concentrated effort to make history at the time. In fact, the first WrestleMania match of his that one could consider really good was his victory over Diesel at WrestleMania 12. The battle of the big men was spirited enough and an outgoing Kevin Nash was more than happy to make Undertaker look strong on his way out the door. One year later, 5-0 became 6-0 when The Undertaker defeated Psycho Sid in a convoluted main event to become WWF Champion. The match was pretty bad by most measures, but more importantly, The Undertaker emerged with his first world title win in more than five years. And more important than that, another year passed without him sustaining an arbitrary WrestleMania loss. The streak was still alive. But whether one was aware of the streak or not, they would have found it hard to fault the WWF if they'd had The Undertaker lose at WrestleMania 14. That's because the most imposing challenge to Undertaker's untarnished slate was his Hellspawn brother, Kane. Ever since he first confronted Taker months earlier, Kane had been presented as being just as powerful and just as invincible as his kayfabe sibling. Months of mounting tension led to WrestleMania 14 in Boston, where brother would meet brother in the event's semi-main. Undertaker eked out the victory that night over Kane to the surprise of those who figured it would have been a major feather in Kane's mask to ultimately overpower the Phenom. But Kane didn't go down lightly, requiring three tombstones to finally leave him in a crumpled heap. And so, The Undertaker was now 7-0. Though the previous year's match against Sid was for the WWF Championship, one could certainly argue that this was Undertaker's most memorable WrestleMania match to this point. 
There was an actual storyline to Undertaker and Kane, whereas Taker vs. Sid was kind of randomly thrown together due to the general disarray of the 1997 main event scene. One year later, Undertaker won a WrestleMania bout that was far less memorable as it was, but would have been even less memorable if not for the questionable ending. Now the ruler of the hellish Ministry of Darkness, Taker battled the corporation's lead heavy, the Big Boss Man, inside Hell in a Cell. But while Undertaker's prior two cell matches are all-time classics, this was a dull slog for the finish line, but alas, another Undertaker victory. Oh, and yeah, the, the big boss man was hanged in the post-match, but that grisly sight notwithstanding, The Undertaker's WrestleMania record remained unblemished at 8-0. After missing out on WrestleMania 2000 due to injuries, the biker version of The Undertaker was what rolled into WrestleMania X7 in Houston to do battle with sworn enemy Triple H. While the brawl was probably Taker's best WrestleMania match up until then, and it brought the record to 9-0 at the event, something more notable happened. His record was finally acknowledged. Now granted, this was just a quick offhand mention by Jim Ross on commentary, but regardless, it wasn't until The Undertaker was more than eight matches deep into his personal WrestleMania chronology that the WWF openly broadcast this historic record. One year later, Undertaker waged war with Ric Flair in a highly contentious battle at WrestleMania X8 or 18. Which one do we call it again? The methodical, hate-filled slugfest was an interesting pairing of icons, and one that also gave us the lesser-known spinebuster out of nowhere, courtesy of Arn Anderson. After finishing off Flair with his tombstone instead of the last ride, Undertaker gave us one of the greatest silent acknowledgements in wrestling history. That's because he stood on the apron and slowly unfurled all ten of his fingers before raising both outstretched palms to a sizable cheer. 10-0 indeed. To put that record into perspective, it took 15 more years for any other wrestler to even reach 10 total wins at the event, when John Cena gained a win as part of a mixed tag match at WrestleMania 33. And at the time of Undertaker's 10th win, Cena was still swimming to the shores of the main roster. After polishing off Flair to reach double digits, Taker's WrestleMania resume picked up a couple more no-doubt victories. At Mania 19 in Seattle, Taker was supposed to team with Australian Goliath Nathan Jones against Big Show and A-Train, but it ended up being a handicap match out of deference to Jones's, shall we say, profound clunkiness. In any event, Undertaker winning was the only acceptable result, and that's exactly what happened. The following year, Undertaker's WrestleMania match was all about the pomp and pageantry. Kane had snuffed him out the prior year in a buried alive match, but rather than just, you know, staying dead, the Phenom version of The Undertaker was reborn. And with him came all that old accompaniment, the Graveyard Overture, the Druids, Paul Bearer of course, the Urn and the Hat and the trench coat. And with that sort of grand return, Kane had a better chance of winning a spelling bee while in a medically induced coma than actually beating The Undertaker that night. That win made it a solid dozen. Come 2005, however, the streak was more than just an accomplishment worth calling attention to, it was now a specified target. Randy Orton looked to make good on his legend killer nickname by challenging Undertaker's untarnished mark. In the closing stages of the very competitive bout, Orton deftly reversed a choke slam into an RKO and it looked for all the world like the WWE was about to canonize a 25-year-old Randall Keith as the Demon Slayer. But then, The Undertaker kicked out. A tombstone later, and Orton's dream was all that was killed. With the streak now sitting at 13-0, and with an understandable opening for a loss passed up on, it looked as if WWE was content to let it ride forever. Though Mark Henry would eventually pick up traction as the curator of his self-created Hall of Pain, the hall was still very much under construction in 2006, and he was the one getting the lid closed on him in the WrestleMania 22 casket match. Make that 14-0 for The Undertaker. From there, a pair of championship bouts loomed large, but few truly believed Undertaker's record was in jeopardy. And this should take nothing away from Batista and Edge, but for the respective World Heavyweight title matches at WrestleMania's 23 and 24, the timing just didn't seem right for either man to pull that sword from the stone. And so, despite two very excellent matchups, with the Batista one especially surprising a lot of people at the time, the end result never really seemed to be in doubt. The tombstoning of Drax brought the mark to 15-0, while the money planes grounding at Hell in a Cell notched it up further to 16-0. After 2008, The Undertaker never wrestled in another championship match at WrestleMania, nor did he really need to, in fairness. His streak was now reward enough, and his matches were about to become the hallmark segment of ensuing manias, belt or no belt. 
When Shawn Michaels stepped up to the plate for WrestleMania 25 in 2009, many wondered if the 240-somethings could equal the quality and gravity of their Hell in a Cell match way back in 1997. Depending on who you ask, their Heaven vs Hell epic may not have only surpassed the Cell match, but could even be the greatest WrestleMania match of all time. The half-hour spectacle was a battle for the ages, and after Undertaker gave the world a meme-worthy look of dejection, he caught a Michaels moonsault and planted HBK with the decisive tombstone, climbing to 17-0. A year later, a desperate and freakishly competitive Michaels drew Undertaker's ire and got the rematch he desired. But to receive it, he'd have to stake his career. And here, even the odd Undertaker fan was kind of hoping that maybe he'd take the fall, otherwise we'd have to say goodbye to Michaels' glittering career. But that's exactly what we did at WrestleMania 26, as the two icons nearly equaled their prior effort, and a defiant Michaels went out to another tombstone. Michaels' tearful exodus overshadowed 18-0 to an extent, but 18-0 was still 18-0. By now, it was abundantly clear that The Undertaker's WrestleMania match was an attraction all to itself. Not only because of the streak being on the line, but the increased reduction in Undertaker's work schedule that put more focus on his Mania outings. And because of this, he was very much saving his best performances for that springtime Sunday. The previous four WrestleMania matches had all either been match of the year candidates, or at least comfortably in that conversation. And that certainly didn't change in 2011 when what was apparently intended to be Undertaker vs Sting pivoted into Undertaker vs Triple H after Sting reportedly got cold feet about a move to WWE. The match met the lofty expectations of the new standard for Undertaker's Mania clashes. But rather than build to the usual feverish crescendo, the ending took a different route. The game managed to beat Undertaker down into a writhing shell but just couldn't seal the deal. Then, out of desperation, Taker snared Triple H into Hell's Gate and managed to squeeze out a narrow submission win. Undertaker won, but was shown to be in a bad way afterwards. The following year, it was now The Undertaker who desired revenge, wanting to show that he wasn't as decrepit as the events of WrestleMania 27 seemed to indicate. With 20-0 at the edge of the horizon, Undertaker goaded corporate Triple H into accepting one more match, but there would be two counter caveats. It would take place inside Hell in a Cell, and Shawn Michaels would be the special guest referee. The so-called end of an era match at WrestleMania 28 polarized fans. Some consider it an all-timer, while others found it a little bit inferior and perhaps a bit too self-indulgent. But the end result was indeed 20-0, as Undertaker vanquished Triple H for the third time on the grandest stage of them all. And this one featured an extra scary kickout as Michaels superkicked Taker into a pedigree, possibly the scariest moment of his undefeated streak. And at the time of this video's recording at least, it should be noted that while Undertaker reached 20 WrestleMania wins in 2012, no other wrestler before or since has gone beyond 10 wins at the event. After four years of battling the two click cornerstones, Undertaker moved on to a wrestler in a similar position to Kane and Orton before him. He was an undeniable star that could have used the win over Taker at WrestleMania, and it would have been an acceptable choice in the eyes of many, and his name was CM Punk. Though it wasn't Punk's first wish of being eliminated first in a John Cena vs The Rock World title main event, it still proved to be the best match of a mostly middling WrestleMania 29. After some exciting back and forth, including the timeless Anaconda Vice zombie sit-up spot, Punk succumbed like the 17 other men before him. The streak had reached a staggering 21 victories, but it wouldn't see number 22. On the surface, most figured that there was no reason for Brock Lesnar to defeat The Undertaker. For one thing, he was a part-time talent, and surely WWE wouldn't sacrifice 23 years of build at the altar of someone that only wrestled a handful of times a year. And on top of that, Brock was already a made man, an iconic athlete with legitimate credentials as a UFC heavyweight champion, so it's not like he really needed the boost. When Lesnar took a concussed, weary Undertaker and deposited him with a third F5 at WrestleMania 30, the packed house at New Orleans' Superdome watched with a bit of a half-hearted gaze. Here comes the kick out, most figured. That's why when Chad Patton's hand slapped the mat for a third time, it struck everybody's guts. It felt like a cosmic jostle, a profound shock that causes blood within your veins to evaporate. The streak is dead, we all thought, and the 21 in 1 graphic that flashed overhead confirmed the unthinkable. The 21 event streak seemed so unbreakable that the idea of Brock Lesnar challenging it didn't phase that many fans and critics. 
That's the Brock Lesnar who is a snarling killing machine that's portrayed as every bit the terrifying fighter that he actually is. Just another notch for Undertaker's belt, we all thought. Another tombstone, another number in the win column. But then the opposite happened, and no fan who witnessed it will ever forget how they felt when reality sunk in. In the aftermath, we learned just how arbitrary the decision to end the streak was. Vince McMahon opted to kill off the unbeaten run on the day of WrestleMania 30, believing that 1. No one outside of Lesnar was a viable candidate to end it, and 2. The Undertaker didn't have many matches left, so the sooner the better. So, many years later, the decision to end the streak is still widely debated. Some feel it should have been preserved forever, sanctified and hallowed, while others believe that another wrestler should have gotten the honours, instead of someone like Lesnar that didn't strictly need it. Meanwhile, some were ultimately okay with the booking, because to even the most cynical, seen-it-all-before fan, the streak dying before their very eyes shook them from their default state. The people who relish calling other wrestling fans marks were probably marks themselves when they witnessed the streak's end. Wrestling is at its best when you get caught up in it, even if it requires pissing you off. When Undertaker finally pulled himself up after the match, he was met with increasing applause from fans and ringsiders alike. The pictures told the tale of unanimous respect for a man that sustained such an unforgettable run. And, if one were to speculate, perhaps this was the dead man's so-called last ride. Except it wasn't. In fact, The Undertaker wrestled 19 more times between then and 2020. Five of those matches occurred at WrestleMania. There was a simple but affable win over Bray Wyatt at 31, a convoluted cell match with Shane McMahon at 32, a bit of a hard-to-watch loss to Roman Reigns at 33 that appeared to be his official end, but then a bizarre squash of John Cena at 34, and finally, the well-received Boneyard match win over AJ Styles at 36. 25 event wins is not likely to be matched by anyone. Close to eight months after leaving Styles for dead under a mountain of dirt, Undertaker affirmed his retirement, bringing to an end not only an unparalleled wrestling career, but an event legacy that's just as unequaled. WrestleMania 35 was a recent enough reminder that the grand spectacle can in fact occur without The Undertaker, but it isn't quite the same without him. When Taker is inevitably the headliner of a future WWE Hall of Fame class, there'll be a deep body of work to retroactively dissect. The ghoulish mystique, the harrowing gimmick matches, the awing brilliance of his character work, and the main event rivalries will all spring to mind. The strongest threads in the tapestry that is The Undertaker's WWE legacy will be the ones that make up his WrestleMania streak, as well as the Mania matches that occurred following its end. The variety of opponents he faced is a murderer's row of characters. He faced Jake Roberts and CM Punk, Diesel and Batista, King Kong Bundy and John Cena. He faced the fathers of Charlotte Flair and Tamina and the sons of IRS and Seeker. He battled members of the clique in six different matches across three separate decades. His 10th Mania win was over the face of Jim Crockett Promotions, and his last was over the face of TNA. Ten of his victims are in the WWE Hall of Fame, while four of his opponents are on WWE's active roster today still. Few of the wrestlers have made such an indelible mark on the business that they share the ring in high-profile matches with those many generational waves of talents. That in itself may be the ultimate legacy of The Undertaker and The Streak, forever intertwined as constants in a business and a world where there are fewer constants than we'd like. We tend to fear death and its inevitability, but ironically, wrestling fans embrace the inevitability of both the dead man and his thorough dominance at the most watched wrestling event of the year. The streak may now rest in peace, but it rests with the notion that it sparked attachment, created moments, and cemented a legacy that will never, ever be duplicated.